morning again, if you would open your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 2, Luke chapter 2, we're doing a, a bit of a, a mini-series for Christmas in Luke, Aaron gave us an excellent sermon last week from the Gospel of Luke on the story of Zechariah, we're going to be preaching from Luke, both this Sunday and on Tuesday night, the following passage, and then a following passage next Sunday. We're having a little bit of a a moment with Luke here in this Christmas season, which I'm very much enjoying and continue to look forward to. But Luke 2 this morning, Luke 2, chapter 2, and verses 1 through 7. Uh, This last year, my family had the joy of going on a a vacation to visit some relatives uh, in Colorado. We were able to see some of the beauties of the Rocky Mountains, and you can imagine the anticipation when you're driving through those mountains and, and hoping for a sight of something extraordinary. And I'd like to invite you to imagine just for a moment that we were doing that together. Let's imagine for a moment that we're in some uh, ginormous bus or something, and we're winding around those Roads, And then as we are looking for some vista, we, we notice on the side of the road a, a small trailhead opening. It's overgrown, doesn't seem particularly impressive, no signage, uh, nothing to mark it out in a particular way. Somebody throws out a suggestion, should, should we see where that goes? And no, 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 there's a course, it, it, it can't be that significant. I think the nice ones are, are all marked and we keep going. And the day ends... And only later do we find out that that small, insignificant, ordinary-looking trailhead was actually the opening to the most magnificent panorama that you could see of those mountains. You could push away through the the thorny overgrowth and come upon a sparkling lake and snow-capped peaks and mighty pines and just a, a dazzling beauty just beyond the ordinary appearance. Well, that trail is, in many ways, what Luke chapter 2, verse 1 through 7 is. It invites us to see the divine irony present in the coming of Jesus Christ to this world as a baby. The passage itself works with irony. Irony is the opposite of what you think is going on is what's going on. Or in this case, Luke's readers and we are aware of something profound that is not not obvious to the plain human intellect or human appearance. It, it, It wouldn't seem to be the case that the majesty that is actually contained here is as majestic As it is. Yet that's Luke's point. That the glory of the true king is hidden. It is disguised. The true king is concealed. Contrary to what any naked eye would tell you, contrary to human intellect, contrary to what seems to be obvious, the true king is present but concealed. And we must press past that ordinary opening to come across the majestic vision we were made to see. So let's do that together. Let's pull over at the side of this particular trailhead. Let's press past the ordinary and see the vision that we were made to see. Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, 
to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. Lord, bless the preaching of this word. The mention of Caesar Augustus creates an immediate contrast in this passage. In order to understand the passage, we we want to go from the beginning to the end and sort of see the scope set in juxtaposition to each other. Caesar Augustus, the adopted son of Julius Caesar himself, Octavian, you may know of him uh, from history, the man who conquered uh, Anthony and Cleopatra, who became the first emperor of the great and mighty Roman Empire. This is that Caesar Augustus. This is well into his reign. He has established himself. He is, in this part of the globe at least, the undisputed high and mighty emperor of the nations, Caesar Augustus, a name actually given to him by the Roman Senate, Augustus. He was the august one. He was the great one. He was Caesar. And if you jump ahead to verse 7, in contrast, you have an infant wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger because they can't even get a room at an inn. The contrast that Luke sets up is intentional. From the human eye to the human intellect, there is one individual here who has overwhelming power, overwhelming prestige, might, and prominence, and one individual who has none. One individual who has connections and the ability to decree and the world begins to move. Another individual who doesn't even have enough connections for his own mother to rate a private room after she gives birth. He is laid not even in a human dwelling, but in a manger where animals feed. Notice the contrast. Luke is setting up this contrast intentionally. You have Caesar and you have Jesus. You have the mighty and you have the weak. You have the all-powerful and you have the powerless. You have the center and you have the exile. The contrast is intentional. It is stark. And yet, Luke gives hints that all might not be as it seemed. Did you notice that Caesar Augustus gives this decree for the world to be registered, the Roman world to be registered, and that causes people to scurry, apparently, to their hometowns, the towns of their ancestral lineage. That causes Joseph to go to his background town of Bethlehem, the city of David. But we've already been informed in Luke that this baby is going to be the mighty son of David that was prophesied in Malachi 2 and elsewhere. That this, Malachi 5 rather, that this this son is going to be the promised son of David who will rule over God's people. And Micah prophesied that David's great son would be born in Bethlehem. Now, Nazareth is roughly 80 to 90 miles away from Bethlehem. It was a long journey. Joseph and Mary are likely very poor, and so they probably would have been traveling it by foot. The tradition of a donkey is from early church history. We don't have any record of that uh, in the scriptures. Most likely, they actually basically walked from Nazareth, the 80 miles, all the way to Bethlehem. So this was not a journey that they would have been making on a regular basis, surely. In other words, if it were not for the mighty emperor of the Roman world making this decree, it seems highly unlikely that Jesus would have been born in Bethlehem. Surely, surely even an average husband wouldn't recommend a spontaneous trip 80 miles away walking to his almost about to deliver pregnant betrothed woman. So we begin to see something Behind the obvious, somehow Caesar, the mighty Roman emperor, is being used to bring about God's 
prediction, God's prophecy, that his mighty king would be born in the city of David. We begin to see something behind what's obvious. It is almost as though, unknowingly and unwittingly, Caesar is actually doing God's bidding. Luke invites us to see beyond the ordinary. Caesar seems powerful, but in the end, unbeknownst to him, and certainly unknowingly, this couple makes their way to Bethlehem, and the Messiah, the Savior, is born precisely where God intended him to be born. It is almost as though Luke is inviting us to see Jesus as the main point of Caesar himself. That Caesar himself is merely a birth attendant to the Messiah. He is a prop in the story of Jesus Christ. Caesar assumes he is at the center. He assumes he is all-powerful. He decrees and people move. And yet behind his decree, there is God's decree. Hundreds of years earlier, the Savior will be born in Bethlehem. One gets the sense that Caesar is merely the glove on the hand of God, moving his pieces where he wants them. Next, we notice past this decree, this emphasis on Bethlehem, which Luke writes is the city of David. And he emphasizes he's going there because he is of the house and lineage of David. There's this accent on David, which again, to the the plain human perspective, doesn't seem of any note. Bethlehem had no strategic military value. It was a few miles outside of Jerusalem. It wasn't a center of of, of major population. It wasn't a strategic center. It wasn't a a cultural center. Uh, Rome wasn't concerned about political fervor in Bethlehem. This was a small village that doesn't rate any notice on the world scale. You have Rome, and then you have Bethlehem. The contrast is stark. You might think today of some some center kind of city, perhaps New York, perhaps, or London, or some other major metropolis, and then some tiny village in the backwoods somewhere where a few families gather for their, their homely meals. Not the center of any cultural movement or power or political stature, no, but here is Bethlehem contrasted with Rome, and yet Joseph's going there because it is David's birthplace. And God promised to David in 2 Samuel 7 that he would give him a son. And this son would be an eternal son. It would create an eternal kingdom. God promised to David he would build him a house. And so when Joseph says he is of the house of David, it brings that to mind. There's going to be a king, God's chosen king, and he is going to rule the nations with a rod of iron. Psalm 2 says kings of the earth will come to him, and they had better because if they don't, he will crush them like a potter's vessel. So Joseph, of all the people that is attached to Mary, of whom Jesus is born, he is of the house of David. So that those that are in his household have a right to the claim of David's promises, to be the heir of this promise, to be God's anointed coming king. Do you see what Luke's doing? What appears to be worthless and weak and ordinary is, in fact, the center of God's plan. He goes there with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child, and while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. Surely everyone can imagine the sense of vulnerability and weakness going into labor in a strange city, none of your familiar relatives around you. This likely older man present with you, but without your mother or any of your female friends to help you in that moment. You're just here in the strange city, and one gets the impression that they they could not even find a room for them to be in, even in this most vulnerable moment. Again, notice the extreme 
extreme weakness. Luke is at pains to emphasize this, the extreme vulnerability. Could there be a more vulnerable situation than a woman in labor in a strange city that cannot even find a room? Cut off from all of her friends. They're they're 80 miles away. They're, they're, They're not nearby, and here she is. And apparently there's not even enough hospitality in David's own city to take care of this woman, perhaps fighting contractions as she goes from door to door. Do you feel the weakness, the vulnerability? You remember the contrast with Caesar, the mighty Caesar in Rome, who appears strong, who appears mighty, who decrees and the world moves, and even pregnant women have to travel 80 miles to only give birth in a strange town. Who seems mighty and who seems weak? The weakness continues. She gives birth to her firstborn son, She wraps him in swaddling cloths, which is a way of protecting an infant, keeping them secure, because as we all know, infants don't have control over their own limbs. It's a way of securing that very most vulnerable one. But then this precious infant can't be laid in a sweet crib with cuddly blankets and pillows surrounding him. No, he has to be laid in a a feeding trough. One gets the impression that Mary, in her exhaustion, needs to lay him somewhere. Perhaps she's tired as well. She needs to lay him somewhere, but there is just nowhere for him to be. She doesn't want to put him on the ground in the dirt So perhaps slightly better is to put him in this feeding trough, or at least he's elevated, surrounded perhaps by the saliva of the animals that have been eating out of it. You feel the weakness, the the vulnerability, the the shame, and as if to to cap it off and make the point explicit, Luke ends the, the, the paragraph by saying, there was no place for them in the inn. You've all seen newborns. They, they feel like they could break without doing anything to them. They're fragile. Their skins are fragile. Their bones are fragile. Their, their skulls aren't even fully formed yet. You can see their heart beating through the skin of their head. And this tiny, helpless, vulnerable one is laid in this feeding trough. Perhaps his mother, exhausted, could get a few moments of rest. Consider, how vulnerable is this couple in this moment? Does this couple seem powerful? Or more, does this child seem important? No. No. We must not put a glaze over our evaluation of this passage. The sort of nostalgic, Christmassy, Western uh, sweetness that we tend to put, oh, away in a manger, no crib for it. It's almost as like this was sweet and nostalgic and kind of homey. No, it was not. It was harsh, cruel, and an absolute failure. It was brutal. It was absurd. And that's just if you consider him as a mere human. What makes this even more absurd and astonishing is that Luke's readers are aware, as we are aware, that this is not just a human. At the very least, Mary would have been aware that the prophecies anticipated this is God's king. He is the coming Messiah. He is the mighty one who will conquer the enemies of God's people, who will restore them to their rightful place in the center of God's purposes. This is great David's greater son, and there is no room for him even in David's hometown. And yet the mystery is deeper. Because as we know, and as Luke's readers would know, he is not just a king. He 
is God. He is God the Son. With a heartbeat, you can see through his still unclosed skull. He is God the Son. So fragile that the slightest wrong move could damage him. So vulnerable he must eat every few hours to stay alive. But he is God the Son. The biblical teaching makes it very clear that Jesus did not stop being God when he became incarnate. He did not temporarily stop being God the Son. No, he continued as God the Son, but he joined to himself a human nature so that he was simultaneously God and having all of the rights and prerogatives of his divine nature, and yet truly, inconfusedly, as the confession said, he was man. He was as man as any human person has been. He wasn't man with a divine exoskeleton. He wasn't man with some kind of protective divine covering. No, he was as man as any man here, as human as any human here. He was as vulnerable and weak as any human being. He was precisely the way every human being is. So here's the incredible, incredible irony. The God who is sustaining Caesar's life is at the same time lying in a manger. The God who is watching over the stars is at the same time lying among the saliva of animals. The God who is simultaneously the mighty victor of heaven and the praise of angels is simultaneously experiencing breath for the first time. He is breathing. His lungs are processing the oxygen he is sustaining. His heart is pumping the blood he is maintaining. Do you see the disguise? Apart from Revelation, who would think that tiny, helpless form left out of the nicer or even the not nicer rooms of Bethlehem is significant, is important, is the thing we were made to see. No one. Luke invites us to see what no one can see apart from faith. Now why? Why did God allow this? Let's get in for just a moment into the the, the actual perspective of heaven. Why did God allow himself to be demeaned in this way at his birth? Why? Why couldn't God have at the very least allowed him to have a room? Why the emphasis? Why the extreme? Why the sense of exile? Why the sense of degradation? Did he really have to be in a manger? Couldn't God come to earth at least have raided a bed? Couldn't his mother at least have raided a room? Couldn't the woman who bore God the Son in her body at least have raided some privacy? Couldn't God have at least afforded this family Some kind of dwelling of some level of comfort. Did he really have to be pushed out of town and laid in a manger, laid in an animal trough? Did he really have to be so degraded and so weak? Why did God allow this? God didn't cease to be God. God the Son didn't cease to be God. God the Father is watching this. All the angels are watching this. Why are they allowing this? Listen, we, we have to get into the mindset of heaven to appreciate the shock of this. There is, there is a shock here that we have to get a hold of. This is not gentle Jesus, meek and mild, who actually secretly loves mangers and couldn't wait to come down from heaven to just get in a manger. No, this is a shock. Shocking degradation. This is appalling. 
Listen, remember the passage Bart quoted from this morning. The God that those angels dare not look at is, we might almost say, treated like an animal. Why? Why? Why the shocking, demeaning, degrading expulsion from society? Why this level of weakness to make a point? This is why he came. He did not come the first time to conquer. He came to be weak. He came to suffer. He came to be exiled. He came to be degraded. He came to be so ordinary that no one would notice him so that he could eventually suffer on a cross and die in place of ordinary men and women. He did not come to be worshipped Primarily, he came to be scourged. He did not come to be adored in the first place. He came to be hated. He came to suffer. And this opening scene of his life, it indicates that it's it's as though Luke is saying, notice this sign. Notice this opening. Do you see this individual you see how weak he seems you see how vulnerable he seems do you see how maligned he seems and yet he is the son of david do you see this one who seems to be at the whim of caesar well he will seem to be at the whim of other human rulers and yet he is the centerpiece of god's plan do you see this one who has no power and no might and no prestige and no honor he actually is god the son and you will see him this way again You will see him this way again. Learn to notice these signs because you will see him this way again. God the Son, one day again, would appear to be the ultimate in human weakness, the ultimate in human shame, the ultimate in human degradation, the ultimate in human exile when he was hanging on that cross. He would have the same dichotomy. The one sustaining oxygen would be the one experiencing the gasping of his lungs for air. The one sustaining the nerves in his own arms would experience the pain of those nerves as nails were pierced through him. The one who is capable now of hearing physical sound through physical ears would hear people mocking him and the same irony would take place. Surely not. Surely not. So sure were the people that this pathetic figure could not be the king that they threw it in his face. Look here, the king of the Jews. And all of heaven resounds, yes, look here, the king of the Jews. What's Luke's point? Don't overlook the hidden glory of the true king. Don't overlook the hidden glory of the true king. For his people, those who have eyes to see, there is a glory in his humiliation. It is precisely his humiliation that makes him glorious to us. He wasn't magnificent in spite of his humiliation. He was magnificent because of his humiliation. He wasn't God's mighty king in spite of his vulnerability and his shame and his exile. He was God's mighty king because of his shame and his exile and his degradation and his suffering and his physical vulnerability leading ultimately to death. The manger anticipates the cross. The manger anticipates the the way in which God's redemption would, would unfold. The sign of the manger is the sign of the hidden and disguised king, the son of David who would suffer on the cross to save his people. Don't overlook. In fact, marvel at the glory of the hidden king. 
Marvel at it. Marvel at how the manger anticipates the cross. Marvel at how his vulnerability, God, contracted to a span. The one who made the worlds made man. Veiled in flesh, the Godhead see. Hail, incarnate deity. This is why Paul can say, the blood of God purchased the church. Don't overlook the glory of the hidden king. Now, what difference does this make for us? If we come through that trail and we press past the ordinary expectations of our lives to look for power and beauty and prestige, and let's not deceive ourselves, we are a product of this culture as well, and we look for those things on a daily basis. We are prone to appreciate power and beauty and prestige. We are prone to crave them in the same way that our culture does. And we must retrain ourselves to come here and admire the glory concealed. Or else we will miss it as well. What difference does it make if we are truly marveling at the glory concealed? What difference does it make for us? Let me give you four applications. Four applications. Number one, it should humble our pride. It should humble our pride. How do you know if you're actually on that trail? Not just deceiving yourself that you affirm mentally the cross and the incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ. How do you know if you're actually on the trail, if you're actually at the manger, if you're actually enjoying the truly hidden glory of the disguised king. How do you know? Well, one way you know is that it should humble your pride. Consider the wrongness of pride standing next to the manger. Can we exalt ourselves or cling to our rights when the king of kings is laid in a manger? Can we boast When he cries for food? Are we impressed with ourselves? When the Lord is exiled even out of a small village. Because that's what it took to save us. Do we crave the center of attention when the Lord Jesus was forgotten, neglected, Should we not count it an honor in light of the one who laid in the manger to humble ourselves towards him? How do you know if we're on this trail? How how do we know? How do I know if I'm actually on the trail? If I'm getting close to the manger, and even more importantly, if I'm getting close to the cross, how do I know? Well, our pride is increasingly humbled. The next time you're offended because someone isn't respecting you enough, go in your mind to the manger and ask the question, can I dare be proud next to him? Second thing it should do, second way we can know we are on that trail, we are kneeling at that manger, it transforms our greed into generosity. We would be fools to assume we don't crave earthly comfort and earthly possessions. But will we crave them when God the Son is wrapped merely in swaddling cloths, surrounded by animals with nothing? The Prince of Heaven has nothing, and will we crave that one new thing? Will we withhold the gift of what we have for others when he is there in the manger? Surely not. 
What effect does going down that trail have on the hearts of God's people? What causes them to exchange greed for generosity? It, it makes giving up, as he did, an honor. Barely a sacrifice, actually a joy, a privilege. Is there someone who has need of room? Would we dare bar our door when God the Son is outside of Bethlehem? J.C. Ryle says this. A mean dwelling place and coarse food and a hard bed are not pleasing to flesh and blood, but they are the portion which the Lord Jesus himself willingly accepted from the day of his entrance into the world. Wealth ruins far more souls than poverty. When the love of money begins to creep over us, let us think of the manger at Bethlehem, of him who was laid in it, such thoughts may deliver us from much harm. What's the third thing it does? If we're on this trail, if we're there at that manger, it increases our trust in his sovereign love. Consider the fact that the world's mightiest emperor at the time, was simply a tool in the orchestration of Jesus' birth. That was not an exception. The Bible teaches that that is true of every world emperor, of every world ruler. They are simply tools in the ongoing story of Christ, the ultimate king. Rome itself was merely an instrument in God's accomplishment of his purpose. What does this mean for us? It should increase our trust in his sovereign love. Let there be no worries about the raging and rising and falling of political leaders, parties, nations, or people of influence. The Lord is still using them now as he did then. Every Caesar is just the unknowing instrument in his hands to bring about his purposes in Christ. And his purposes are for the good of his people. God is not merely a mighty sovereign. He is a mighty sovereign who uses the world to rescue his people, to do them good. J.C. Ryle again says this, the heart of a believer should take comfort in the recollection of God's providential government of the world. A true Christian should never be greatly moved or disquieted by the conduct of the rulers of the earth. He should see with the eye of faith a hand overruling all that they do to the praise and glory of God. He should regard every king and potentate, an Augustus, a Cyrenius, a Darius, a Cyrus, a Sennacherib, as a creature who, with all his power, can do nothing but what God allows, and nothing which is not carrying out God's will. And when the rulers of this world set themselves against the Lord, he should take comfort in the words of Solomon, there be higher than they. The coming of Jesus to Bethlehem by the decree of Caesar is enough comfort for any political, national, or cultural storm. Because the purposes of Jesus are still what God uses governments ultimately for. Not knowingly, not intentionally, but certainly nonetheless. God will use even a proud, arrogant ruler of Rome. And certainly he can use any number of proud, arrogant rulers of every nation on earth to actually accomplish his good purposes for the ultimate glory of his son. Let there be no quaking and worrying when the Caesars of this world battle for prominence. There is one higher than they. Finally, it should elevate. Getting, getting there, getting in that trail 
seeing that vision, God the Son in a manger, and traveling that trail until it comes to Calvary, God the Son on the cross, it should cause us to elevate our worship of Jesus Christ. Surely it should be our privilege to exalt the one who was lowered to save us. Is any emotion too high for the one who laid in the manger? Is any praise too loud for the one who heard mocking cries on the tree? Is any depth of feeling too deep for the one who went to the grave to rescue us? Is there any joy too abundant for the one who was the man of sorrows in our place? Is there any willing sacrifice and willing worship too robust for the one who was robed in scorn to rescue us? Is, is there any elevation of worship that is too far beyond the glory of God the Son who took on an infant's form and grew into a man to suffer in our place and go to the grave to save us? Is there any, any amount of worship and affection too great for this glorious and hidden king? Consider the glory of the hidden Savior and come. Surely his people that have been on that trail again and again, go there to worship him. Surely we go there to bow before him and to exalt him. Let us have in our minds the truth that Augustine wrote 1700, nearly 1700 years ago. Man's maker was made man. That the bread might hunger, the fountain thirst, the light sleep, the way be tired on its journey, that the truth might be accused of false witness, the teacher be beaten with whips, the foundation be suspended on wood, that strength might grow weak, that the healer might be wounded, that life might die. Why? Why the manger? Why the exile? For the eyes of faith it is a signpost toward Calvary. This is what he came to do. Come, let us adore him. Let's pray. Let me invite Rob to come up and join me. Lord Jesus, help us to go to these moments again and again. Bring us to your side to adore you. Cause every aspect of our lives, our Lord, our humility, our generosity, our trust, our worship, be transformed by your hidden glory. Lord, 
as the Puritan said, enlarge our heart and warm our affections. Receive our affections now, Lord Jesus, in song. Hear our voices. Receive them as our grateful adoration of you.